Hello and welcome to Phil Fisher's Get Data Protection Fit series for 2023. My name is Anna Rawlinson and I'm a senior associate in our data team in London. I'm joined today by an associate, M.Y.L. Tagian, and a solicitor apprentice, Casey Ann Keating. For those of you who joined our previous Get Data Protection Fit programs, welcome back. And for those of you who are new to this series, we hope you find it useful. Our Get Data Protection Fit series focuses on bite-sized training for lawyers and privacy professionals. We are currently in the third year of this series and the topic of the last module, available on our YouTube channel, was how to document your data protection compliance. In our new series, we are focusing on international data transfers. We've started in January with EU standard contractual clauses and the UK addendum. In this session, we'll be looking at the UK International Data Transfer Agreement, the IDTA, and we will move on to transfer impact assessments in March, binding corporate rules in April, and then the UK's Data Reform Bill in May. The team here at Phil Fisher hope that by the end of this session, you should be able to explain the following learning outcomes. What the IDTA is, the deadline for implementing the IDTA, structure and style of the IDTA, its substance, and how the IDTA compares to the UK addendum used with USCCs. So what is the IDTA? It is the new UK-specific data transfer tool issued under Section 119A of the Data Protection Act 2018. It provides appropriate safeguards required under Article 46 of the UK GDPR to transfer personal data to recipients who do not benefit from the UK adequacy regulations. The purpose of the IDTA is to ensure that the level of protection of personal data guaranteed under the UK GDPR is not undermined following a transfer out of the UK. The IDTA, which came into force on 21st of March 2022, is essentially the UK's equivalent to the EU standard contractual clauses and provides an alternative option to using the EU SCCs with the UK addendum. Organisations are free to choose between option 1, which is using the IDTA, or option 2, which is the, using the EU SCCs with the UK addendum. So far, there has been no indication from the ICO that one option may be more appropriate than the other for certain types of transfers or for certain types of organisations. Regardless of whether organisations exporting UK data choose to use the IDTA or EU, the EU SCCs with the UK addendum, they will have to comply with the requirement to carry out a transfer impact assessment or, using the ICO's terminology, a transfer risk assessment. And if required, they will need to implement supplemental measures. The TIA methodology is based on the EDPB guidance and the ICO's new TRA guidance and the TRA tool will be explained by our colleagues in the next session of Get Data Protection Fit in March. I will now hand you over to Casey Ann, who will talk about the structure and style of the IDTA and about an important date to keep in mind in this context. This important day is the 21st of March 2024, which is the deadline for switching over from any existing transfer arrangements which incorporate the old SECs to the IDTA or the EU SECs within the UK addendum. This long stop date will apply, provided that the process and operations covered by the old SECs remain unchanged. However, generally, there is a good argument for switching to one of the new UK transfer tools earlier, as the old SECs provide insufficient protection in terms of the government access to data. The first thing to note is that the ICO has avoided use of the term SCC, presumably to highlight that it is not following the EU approach. There are some notable differences in the look of the IDTA compared to the EU SCCs. There are no modules. Instead, the IDTA adopts a structure where almost all the clauses apply to all types of transfers, C2C and C2P, for example, and only remarkably few clauses are specifically stated to apply to certain types of transfers only. The most prominent example is the imposition of the GDPR data protection principles on controllers only. The IDTA adopts a plain English approach, similar to the ICO guidance, includes a legal glossary and that, combined with its structure, makes it more user-friendly and easier to follow. 
More generally, the IDTA is divided into four parts. Part one is made up of tables, which essentially serve the same purpose as the annexes in the EU SCCs. Part two has extra protection clauses in table format to be added if the transfer risk assessment identifies that supplementary measures are needed. And part three has optional commercial clauses in table format if there is no accompanying commercial agreement. Lastly, part four includes mandatory clauses, which is the real meat of the document. It is a flexible document. If the parties wish to change the tabular format of the first three parts, they may do so, provided that the change does not reduce the appropriate safeguards. Now we're going to look at the content of the first table. It will include the start date of the agreement, parties' details, key contacts, signatures, and with some differences as to the details required, its content is similar to Part A of Annex 1. Table 2 sets out transfer details, which are more extensive than those in Part B of Annex 1. Two most important differences are the confirmation that the IDTA can also be used if the importer is directly subject to the UK GDPR, which is a welcome point of clarity from the ICO, and the concept of the linked agreement, where the importer is a processor or sub-processor instructed by the exporter. The linked agreement is a wider commercial agreement that also sets out the processing instructions for and processor terms. As a result, unlike the EU SECs, the IDTA does not include Article 28 processor terms. Table 3 describes the types of transfer data, including special categories of data, data subjects and purposes of processing. Importantly, it can be completed by reference to the linked agreement, which will normally include all the details. Table 3 helpfully sets out that the parties can choose whether the IDTA will be automatically updated if the information in the linked agreement is updated, which is a pragmatic solution, or whether the parties will have to agree a change separately. Lastly, Table 4 includes security requirements. It largely reflects Annex 2 of the EU SECs, but requires less granular information than the EU SECs. It can also be completed by reference to the linked agreement and is automatically updated if the information in the linked agreement is updated. I will now hand you over to Emma, who will discuss Part 4 of the IDTA, the mandatory clauses. Thank you, Casey. We are now going to move on to discuss the legal substance of the UK IDTA. As you might expect, since the UK and EU regimes are currently similar, the legal obligations and concepts contained in the IDTA and the EU SCCs are also similar. Casey has already taken you through the structure and style of the document, so I will speak to the substance of the IDTA and I've pulled out some of the key points on the slide to discuss. I'll first go through the mandatory clauses and then I'll focus on key departures from the EU SCCs. Following on from the tables in the first three parts, in part four, we have 36 mandatory clauses. These clauses cannot be edited or amended except in very narrowly described cases, for example, to cross-reference or to remove sections that are simply not applicable, which might include when the importer is directly subject to the UK GDPR. These amends can only be made provided that the changes do not reduce the appropriate safeguards. As might be expected, there are the key exporter and importer obligations. Key exporter obligations include complying with UK data protection laws when transferring data to the importer, to carry out reasonable checks on the importer's ability to comply with the IDTA, and the exporter is also obligated to cooperate with the importer. Key importer obligations include only processing transferred data for the identified purpose, keeping a written record of its processing to demonstrate its compliance with the IDTA, cooperating with and providing reasonable assistance to the exporter, and complying with a number of obligations if there's a data breach, also when engaging subcontractors and transferring data onto third parties. The IDTA contains obligations on both parties to ensure that the IDTA provides appropriate safeguards following the transfer and a level of security which is appropriate to the risk of and impact of a personal data breach. In part two of the IDTA, there is a table for extra protection clauses, which may need to be added to address any supplementary measures required as a result of the Schrems II decision. The mandatory clauses impose an obligation on the parties to review the agreement at regular intervals to ensure the IDTA remains accurate and up-to-date and the safeguards and security measures continue to be appropriate. There is a clause addressing what the parties must do if they no longer believe that the security measures and safeguards are appropriate. 
The mandatory clauses also contain information about data subject rights, including a right to a copy of the IDTA and information about the relevant linked agreement to the extent it's referred to in the tables. Business secrets and confidential information can be redacted. The clauses go on to make it clear that the importer does not have to respond to data subject rights requests where there are exceptions under UK data protection law, for example, if the request is manifestly unfounded or excessive. Unsurprisingly, in line with the Schrems II decision, the IDTA also addresses the importer's obligations regarding third-party access to transferred data under local law. The importer is obliged to challenge the validity of a request if in the circumstances it is reasonable on the basis that there are significant grounds to believe that the request is unlawful. Where permitted under local law, it should notify the relevant party about the request and keep a written record of it. The mandatory clauses also contain points regarding liability. The key point here is that the parties cannot include in the IDTA or the linked agreement anything that limits or excludes either party's liability to relevant data subjects or to the ICO under this IDTA or under data protection laws. The ICO is entitled to bring a claim against either the exporter or importer for breaches of certain provisions of the IDTA. As mentioned by Casey Ann, if the importer is a processor or sub-processor, we have the concept of the linked agreement. The mandatory clauses of the IDTA set out that the linked agreement must contain the processor terms compliant with Article 28 of the UK GDPR. If there's any conflict between these agreements, the IDTA takes precedence over the linked agreement. The IDTA also recognises the possibility that audit provisions may have been agreed under the linked agreement and that those provisions will apply under the IDTA as well. This is helpful as it means the parties have more scope to negotiate those often tricky audit terms and ensure that they are practical. There is also an alternative dispute resolution mechanism contained in the IDTA, which allows for the parties to arbitrate rather than just go through the courts. This is helpful from the ICO as it allows the parties greater scope to resolve any disputes. And finally, the IDTA addresses TRAs. Section 8 sets out that prior to any transfer, the importer must provide the exporter with all relevant information regarding local laws, practices and protections, or risks that may apply to the transferred data so the exporter can conduct their TRA. The IDTA sets out that the parties must regularly review the TRA, and this review period should be included in the tables. This should encourage the parties to set a review schedule specific to the relevant risk profile. So, for example, low risk tr transfers may be reviewed less frequently than high risk transfers. I will now pass back over to Anna. Thank you, Emma. So, how does the IDTA compare to the UK addendum used with the US CCs? Whilst the IDTA might be more user friendly, the option of using the UK addendum benefits from familiarity. This means that the switch over to the IDTA, despite comparable legal obligations, might be perceived as a bigger change for those organisations that have been using the legacy SCCs and are also using the EU SCCs for transfers of EU data. And potentially, it may also lead to more questions from the counterparties who are not familiar with this new UK specific tool. Based on what we've seen in practice, the take up of the IDTA seems to be rather low, and this concerns not only organisations with both UK and EEA data flows, for whom the UK addendum offers chance to adopt a unified approach to contracting, but also those UK focused organisations. It remains to be seen whether the upcoming ICO guidance on the IDTA and the UK addendum which is supposed to include a clause by clause commentary to both documents, will in any way affect these preferences. And this brings us to the end of today's presentation. We hope that you are now better able to explain what the IDTA is, the deadline for implementing the IDTA, structure and style of the IDTA, its substance, and how the IDTA compares to the UK addendum used with the EU SCCs. If you're interested in learning more about data and privacy, our Data Team YouTube channel launched in 2020 hosts a variety of content for lawyers and privacy professionals. This includes the fundamentals of data protection law, 
subscriber Q&As and mini-series such as our current series on international data transfers. We have some details here on the slide on how you can join our YouTube channel and how you can subscribe to receive our team's email, digest and periodic updates on topical data and privacy issues. Thank you for joining us today and we hope you join us next month for Phil Fisher's data team session on transfer impact assessment and for the rest of our international data transfer series.